Of all of life's lessons, the lesson of limitation is the one that each of you has learned best. The lesson of limitation is drummed into you throughout your life, life after life after life. It has been the founding truth of the duality. The duality that is by its true nature a lie. There isn't any evil, there isn't any darkness, there isn't any fear, there's only love. But a duality was constructed. How do you convince a God that he is not a God? In order that he be, may become more of a God. The law of the universe is growth. The universe is one. The universe is God. You are inextricably a part of God. Perfect, whole, utterly strong, utterly knowing. And yet you put on the blindfold, go into the darkness for the purpose of experiencing the illusions of fear, playing with believing those illusions, feeding them the power of your belief until they would jump out and say booga booga to you, convincingly frightened, lost from your true nature, believing that you are helpless. Every lesson in your life, from the beginning, from the moment of birth, when you were born into complete helplessness, utter dependence, immediately and, uh, and uh, without warning, losing most of your consciousness, all of your power. What is the lesson? I am weak. I am incapable. I can't. I can't take care of myself. I need someone else to take care of me. I am inadequate to survive. Dependency is implanted in you immediately. And the lessons that follow hammer at home. You take the uh, lessons on the violin. Amid your parents' uh, hopes and uh, dreams that you will be a great concert violinist. And after a while you discover either you're bored with the violin or you get to a point and you can't seem to get good enough. The girl next door who rarely practices is wonderful. I'm no good. I'm limited. You're chosen last for the baseball game. I'm no good. I'm limited. The only girl in the world or the only boy in the world won't even look at you. Limitation. Taught again and again that in crucial ways you aren't qualified. Born into a sense of loss a forgotten memory of who you truly are, a heritage of failure, of guilt, that you bring with you life after life, brought about by the imbalance in those lives, the awareness of how many ways you have fallen short of the glory of God, going back and back and back and back through every life, back to the first humans on earth, the Atlanteans, having destroyed through their pride, through their arrogance, a planet, a home, a life, a people, driven in exile, to a new planet, yes, with uh, a great deal of abilities to change the planet, to change life forms, to begin again, 
but not after a long, long sojourn in darkness and ignorance. If you think the Middle Ages of this era were dark and barbarous, when the Atlantean civilization and its remnant were lost on earth, gradually succumbing out of their, uh, the few that uh, were there and gradually forgetting generation to generation what they knew. Years of darkness and carrying with you the guilt. There's your original sin. Born as a human being with the knowledge that you had destroyed your own home. Everything you have learned on earth has told you that you're not good enough, that you must prostrate, uh, prostrate yourself before gods, whether the gods be of gold, of, uh, of flesh, of spiritual origin, that enormous awareness that you are weak has colored every aspect of your life throughout history, preventing you ever, ever, in any life, even lives uh, you may look back and you say, well, I was told that I was, uh, I was uh, a, a saint uh, in that life and uh, I must have been really wonderful. Why am I not like that now? Imbalance is the issue not sin. There are lives for each of you in which you have sought the highest, to identify only with God, to leave behind you the bestiality of earth, the animal needs of the human being. Well, that isn't the plan. That's as imbalanced as the most depraved, lustful, animal-oriented life. What's being sought is a balance the blood of the human being and the spirit of the divine become one within you. And so as you look back on these many, many lives, seen and unseen, the continuing awareness, life after life, whatever the particular issues of a life are, maybe betrayal in one life, abandonment, it may be any number of issues, but the same issue underlies all of that. The sense of inadequacy the reality of limitation. Life without limitation is the life of wholeness. It's what you're all in this for. As we've said many times, this is the life. This is it. After all these thousands of years, well, how unlikely. Why is it unlikely that this should be the life that you reach your wholeness? any more unlikely than any of the other lives? Or are you never to reach wholeness? Are you always to wander in the dark, full of fear and ignorance? What a strange destiny that would be. This is the life in which you accept the gift of yourself. The model that was Jesus the Christ showing you who you could be, who you truly were, if you accept love and love only, casting out all fear, if you accept the forgiveness that begins at home, forgiving yourself for crimes uncommitted, and in that process of acceptance of love and the release of fear, seeing through the illusion, finding your true nature, taking away the power of belief from the fears that have plagued you, gradually becoming whole and unlimited. Well, here you are in midstream. And midstream in a rushing river is a chancy place to be. It is frightening. You feel often out of your depth, often out of control in the turbulence of the stream that you have in your willingness allowed to carry you through all of the shoals, 
all of the eddies, all of the whirlpools, all of the rapids, leading to oneness with yourself, ending duality, forgiving yourself, becoming whole, letting go of limitation. But that's not as easy as it might sound. We say to you, well, and we've been saying this for years, all you ever needed was the willingness to say, okay, let's go. But it's taken a lot of lives to lead to the point that you're ready to say that. And then you do it. And is that enough? Yes, it is enough. But it doesn't mean that the rest of it is easy or automatic. It is the sine qua non, that without which the rest cannot happen. So the willingness is not easy, but the absolute necessary starting point. Well, then, as you have found, as you've gone uh, along this uh, course of opening yourself and releasing your fears, that it's not at all what you expected it to be. Not this wondrous opening to the spirit accompanied by choral song, but rather long journeys through the darkness of your soul Every nightmare, every fear that you have had manifesting, threatening to manifest, jumping out and saying boo. Because the necessity has been not for you to rise above your fear, but to allow your fear to enter you in the faith that it is not real, that you will become whole, and that you will see through it, and you do. But it takes a while. It takes a while. And it is complicated further. It is complicated by you. It is complicated because you are trying to pull in two different directions at the same time. Your higher nature says... I want to be free. I want to take full responsibility for my life. I want to believe that I am strong. That I am full of love. That I am perfectly capable of letting go of my fears, becoming whole, fully activated human being. But that is the part of you that's being born. Not the part of you that has ruled for all these lifetimes. That is the increasingly audible but still small voice of the emerging spirit. Now remember that we are talking about a triunity, a balance of body and mind and spirit. For all of these generations, spirit has been, if acknowledged at all, understood in a very, very limited way. You have been taught particularly, you know, the heaviest part of your teaching has been in the last few hundred years, since the age of rationalism formally crowned the mind as king. And since that has occurred, you have been taught and taught and taught and taught not to believe what you can't see and touch and feel, that it's not real that you will be regarded as a fool to believe that which is not real. The only intuitional belief systems that have survived that onslaught of rationalism have been the deeply entrenched religions who have, in order to survive, remained as unchanging as possible while appearing to accommodate changes in societal mood. The adherence to the traditional uh, religions has been very important to keep alive the flame of the irrational. Now you think, well, that's a bad word, irrational. Rational is a good word and irrational is a bad word. But they're simply opposites of the same pole. And who are you? Mind? Alone? Ego? Alone? 
that temporary one lifetime only persona, that's it? No, the greatest part of you is irrational, not of the mind, of the spirit. The true knowledge, the true guide, the true identity. Now, in attempting to release the control of an old belief system that has eliminated from your consciousness the reality of the spirit, now you are going through a difficult process of unlearning as well as new learning, of changing responses so deeply entrenched that they've gone through many, many lives constantly reinforced by the culture in which you live. Don't believe all of that nonsense. And so there is always in this process of you pilgrims who are leading the way to this new age of humankind, there is always a crisis of faith. Always the question, is this real? Am I nuts? Is this what I really should be doing? Is my mother right? <laughs> because you have had expectations as to what becoming whole was going to mean, you're disappointed, a lot of you, most of you, all of you. You wanted it to take a shorter time and to be more fun. <laughs> well, it is. It's a lot of fun. And it is taking a short time. It's only your perspective that needs some changing. Your perspective that has been, again, conditioned by the notion of limitation. Well, I've only got three score years and ten. If that, and if I smoke, less. <laughs> That's not much time to get everything done. So you're always in a hurry because you think there's a deadline. Well, I say to you now that in this life, this limited life, and you're not going to live forever, forever in, this, uh, in these bodies, that for this life there is for each and every one of you going to be exactly the right amount of time to get where you're going. There isn't the rush. So on the one hand, you are wanting to rush into change, to rush into wholeness. Now that you have finally seen the light, you want your life to be magically transformed. All of the fears forgotten, all of the limitations left behind. And of course, that's what's going on. But you don't see it as being quick. Well, when you live outside of time and are aware that eternity is, uh, is, uh, goes on and on and on, then these uh, few years uh, that it is taking you to go through your process of transformation looks like lightning. And it is. You see, you are changing the heritage of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and of lives. Patterns that have been deeply embedded in you. And because this is a process of dying, as well as a process of being born, there are two sources of pain, and there is the desire inbred in you as human beings not to die. The ego part of you, you and you and you, who you think you are, who you see in the mirror, that part of you doesn't want to die. It doesn't want to trust these changes. Power is being taken away from the ego self. It was perfectly happy with rationalization. What is the matter with you that you go into this nonsense about spirits and feelings and visions and inner promptings and so forth? The ego won't have any of it. The fact that you are able to go through this process at all is an indication that the spirit is already being born because this is the spirit's idea, not the ego's. The ego would rather cling to misery 
Because misery is what it knows. Limitation is what it understands. Fear is what it lives in. Home, sweet home. Be it ever so humble. And so as you are hurrying to change, you are also lagging behind, clinging wistfully in fear to old patterns, to old beliefs, primarily to old beliefs about yourself. And so you grow not only confused, reaching in one direction and reaching back in the other, not only confused, but despairing. This was supposed to be great, and it hurts. It hurts because you are leaving behind that which you have known of as yourself. You are dying a psychic death. There aren't any two ways about it. You must be transformed by a process of transformation. It means rebirth. It doesn't mean that you are going to be 100% different than you are now. It doesn't mean that you are going to sprout wings and play a harp. It doesn't mean the kind of perfection that you have been taught is perfection. It means balance. But to achieve the balance, the old self must die. The old self clings, and you curse yourself despite your high beliefs and understandings, that you suddenly think, Oh, I did it again. When will I stop reacting this way or that way? And so you punish yourself. And sometimes you punish yourself by saying, This path thing, this is no good. I'm no better than I ever was. Oh, sometimes I think so, but then I go and do this again. The ego self clings, old patterns cling. Your focus and your perspective need to change in order to accommodate your own transition into wholeness, into a life without limitation. How do you do it? How do you get there from here? This, whatever you may have thought, is the toughest part of the path. Not the early time. Yes, it's hard getting started. It's hard making the commitment and, the, and, uh, and feeling the willingness and uh, beginning the changes in your life. But this is the point of true change. This is where you stop being one thing and start being another. It is a time that often feels empty and always feels confused. A time in which you don't know how to judge a situation because old standards don't seem to apply and you're yet feeling your way into the new confidence, faith and belief and expansiveness that will give you that giant stride ahead so that you can become true to your real nature. Well, it's, uh, it's a tough time. It's a tough time. But it is a magnificent time. It is a magnificent time if you allow it to be, if you focus on the ruts in the road, you're not going to see the scenery by the side. Within you, a revolutionary evolution is taking place. A monumental step. Your consciousness is changing, growing, deepening. Your understanding you are becoming wise, forgiving, loving. And even if through your whole life you had tried to be positive, which very few could say, it's nothing like this. This isn't a determination to change. This isn't a hope for the future. This isn't a matter of policy. This is you, your reality. Somewhere along the line, amidst the struggle, when your attention was elsewhere, you have become whole. 
and don't deny it. Don't listen and don't see the evidence that the old self, that the ego wants you to believe in. Well, I still do this and I'm still not very charitable and I still make judgments all the time and I still do this. How can I be whole? I don't feel whole. If you pay, if you are paying attention to that which is fading away, to the dying grip of a self that is in fact no more, then you will not give the proper energy to the other direction, the birth, who you are becoming. Now, when you listen to Plautus, we talk in large terms and large words and big uh, pictures and, uh, and it all sounds wonderful and perhaps inspirational, but then you get back to your regular life and all of the challenges that you don't notice until they're gone by too late. And the stresses and the strains of dealing with the same people and the same situations, new people and new situations, a reality that's coming pell-mell at you. Well, we want to say to you, see what we are talking about in your own life. Give yourselves a break. <clears throat> Stand aside. Take a look at yourself. See the many ways in which you have changed for the better. In little ways, you know, gossip is awfully tempting. That terrific curiosity about what's going on in someone else's life and behind closed doors and the wonderful nasty speculations uh, that you can uh, make about the vagaries uh, and weaknesses of others and how much better it makes you feel that you're not going through that pain yourself and that you are, for at least the moment of that gossiping, better than the person you're gossiping about. Well, that doesn't, uh, that's, uh, that's a sign of uh, your own weakness and your need to shore yourself up. And those of you that have indulged in that, and that's probably not more than 98, 99% of you, uh, may, may notice that that desire, that curiosity, like everything else, has a pole, has poles to it, positive and negative. Because that interest, that curiosity, that sense of identification is the positive aspect. And you may find now that you're still gossiping in a way, but you're not being so negative. You're even doing a little praising. You can't help it. You're being filled with energy of love. The light is ending the darkness in you. Count the many ways every day or whenever you can. Keep a journal. That's a good way to keep track of, uh, of what's going on. Count the many ways in which you have changed for the better. When you face a situation in, uh, that has thrown you in the past, now it only scares you. That's progress. You're going from being dominated by fear to being intimidated by fear. And then you're going from being intimidated by fear, to being fearless. And your fearlessness is sneaking in the side door. Always, through all these lives, your focus has been on the fear, what I'm afraid of, what I can't do, what I'm not. Begin to change your focus and see what you are, what you can do, and who you're becoming. You will lessen the power of the grip of that self that is leaving you. And you will ease the birth pains that uh, are accompanying your new life. <coughs> You've always heard it said you're your own worst enemy. What a terrible thing to say. Well, it's true, but it's still a terrible thing to say. <laughs> because while it is true... You're also your own best friend. You're your own everything. So 
don't focus on the stumbles, on the pitfalls, on the backsliding, on all of the ways that you fall short of your highest vision of yourself. That doesn't help. Has it ever helped you in your life to get negative criticism from anyone? No, it just makes you feel more limited, a little less capable, a little less lovable, and you do it to yourself all the time. If other people treated you as badly as you treat yourself, you'd be furious. And so, you know, we've called ourselves a cheerleader before, and God knows you need one. You're undertaking the greatest work of all of your lifetimes. The most difficult task. Never before in any of your lifetimes has there been a true transformation. Now, there are going to be many more orthodox Christians who say, now, wait a minute. The experience of being born again is just such a transformation. Well, we have to say it's not. It is a step. It is a glimmering of reality, but too often it is a response to fear and not a voluntary, joyful opening to love. You are running away of that aspect of yourself that you are frightened of and do not trust. It is the imbalance that we spoke of earlier. The saints did great works, but not necessarily for themselves. To escape life is not to live life. To refuse the human part of that human divine equation is to be out of balance with yourself, out of love with yourself, a vast aspect of yourself that you do not love and will not accept. The warts as you see them. You need to see differently. See that reflection of yourself in its true glory. You are an emulation of God. You can be nothing else. There is only God. The general belief in the devil and in hell has faded somewhat but is still, even for many uh, human beings who would say, well, I don't uh, believe in the devil, I don't believe in hell, but they don't live as though they don't believe in the devil and they don't believe in hell. They live full of guilt and fear, afraid of death, and what on earth is going to happen then? Have I been good or have I been bad? You need to change your perspective. The devil, hell, the kings of fear. Fear is illusion. Fear isn't real. Fear you can withdraw belief from and it disappears. It has no substance without that which you give it. Heaven and hell, as you have understand it in its polarity, are what you create in your reality life after life. Can you imagine a hell that would be worse than the worst times in this life or other lives that you have lived? Hell is going through the darkness of the separation from God. You are ending that separation by accepting the gift offered, revealed, and modeled for you by Jesus the Christ where God and man meet, you are, in your process, becoming Christ. Becoming Christ. Reaping. Finally. You need to believe it. To activate it. Despite the clinging hands of the old fears, you need to behave as though you don't believe in limitation. That's the only way you're going to disprove the idea of limitation. You're not going to become intellectually convinced of it. It's too deeply driven into your uh, consciousness. You have to start by acting as though you were whole. 
and you will become whole. Because by acting boldly when you feel timid, shy, and fearful, you change yourself. You activate your courage, which is faith in action. You create a change that there's no stepping back from. You reach beyond what you had regarded as your limits. And so you invent a new idea of limits. Well, that's wonderful. I'm not as weak as I thought. And now I'm as strong as I can get. And then it's time again to challenge that limitation. You're not in this alone. And you need to remember that too. While you are dealing with self and the relationship with self, self is just another atom in God's hide. You are all one. You are being midwifed through this process of birth by many, by friends, by relatives, by extraterrestrials, by spirit guides, and by your own structure. The structure of life that you created before this life began, that has within it, as a structure, Every single base you need to hit, every experience you need for enlightenment, you have the free will to choose any way, to turn down the opportunity again and again and again, but never for the last time because the opportunity won't go away. You go away and come back and go away and come back. The opportunity is always there. And you are building your strength, life after life after life, in the midst of your belief in your weakness, so that you may take, finally, that opportunity to become whole. You have earned this opportunity. You have suffered. You have been blind. You have been alienated. You have been convinced of your separation from God. You've paid your dues. You deserve what is coming and what is here. We have said you are already whole. Now you need to continually prove it to yourself, to leave behind every feeling of former limitation. Now, does that mean leaving behind what you might call common sense? No. We are not taking this, what we have called uh, irrationality, the reality of the spirit and saying that's the whole ball game there because that's not the whole ball game. You are to be human. You are to be divine in one. And so what you do and what you change in your process is a balancing process. And so when you make choices and when you make decisions, if you have, uh, for example, uh, 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 haven't uh, run a block for the last 20 years and you think, I have no limitations, I'm going to break the four-minute mile today, well, I don't recommend it. You are here to be in charge of yourself, and it's taken you a long time to get to the point where you're capable of doing so. You are here to prove to yourself that you are God, the inheritor of all of that ability and all of that power, limited only by the rules of this terrestrial game, this physical universe. So there are parameters within which you, uh, you work, but you don't know what they are, and you won't find out until you keep pressing outward. And so when you make your choices, it is your responsibility to use your wisdom, guided by your intuition, activated by your mind, executed by your body, to achieve and to prove your wholeness. And as these years go by in this life, you will believe if you do not now you will see within yourself the ending of fear. The ending of fear. It's something you can't really visualize, except maybe now you're starting to get the idea that there isn't anything to be afraid of. This life is the beginning. The incarnations that lie ahead for you, however theoretical they may seem to you now, are very real and full of promise. You are done dueling fear. The phrase, life without limitation, is not a slogan. 
It is a reality. It is a reality now. It is a reality for the rest of your lives as human beings. You'll have other challenges, but fear isn't one of them. Limitation isn't one of them. You will continue to expand and expand in your abilities as you continue to learn about your God nature. You are learning to be creators. And you look at a life, at a world full of analogies. You are created in the image of God, of God, to be God. And you are practicing creating life making godlike decisions, enacting increasingly a godlike life. And that sounds like pretty big stuff. It sounds perhaps inflated. And we want it to sound as magnificent as it is. You have spent enough time with little me You've gotten enough proof of all the limitations of everything that you can't do and everything that you're not. That day is over and you're going to have to practice and practice and practice and reiterate and reiterate and reiterate and get up and dust yourself off and go in again and again and again to let go of that need to put yourself down. To be who you truly are, all loving, all forgiving, all trusting, in your life, tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, remind yourself that you are God becoming God. And that in what you may think of as the little things in your life, you have the opportunity to prove to yourself again and again until you finally believe it, that you are whole, that you are one, that you are not limited. It is a time to be kind and loving and encouraging to yourself, to become one with the process of birth, leaving behind the thoughts of the grave, dealing with self and recognizing that self is a part of another self, a greater self, that you are becoming one with or uh, becoming aware of your oneness, that you are reaching out to each other. You know, we emphasize so much dealing with the self. How much you need to give to the self. And sometimes it sounds selfish. But that is where the beginning must be. Healing the self. Believing in yourself. Loving yourself. And as you go through that process, you look out and you see that that love that is filling you is changing the way you see the world. You are seeing now through eyes of love. No longer so hesitant, so embarrassed to ask for help, to offer help, to give and to receive. Trust each other as you are learning to trust yourself. Trust your inner guidance in your interactions with others. You're not going to be fooled. You're not going to be duped. You're not going to be led down the garden path. You're not going to be betrayed and you're not going to be abandoned. Because these are not your brothers and your sisters. They are you. All of the other faces of your eternal self. And as you reach out to each other, as you become whole yourself, you share your power, newly realized, and receive the power and the strength of those who are of you but who are not like you. And so you complement each other. And as you join together, you make a rainbow of energy. The future that is dawning for you in your individual life 
is the future that is dawning for humankind and for earth. We say to you, this is the birth time. You are the pioneers. Your vision, your strength, your wisdom and understanding, and most of all, your love as you unite within yourself, ending the personal duality, unite with each other, ending the general duality, alienation, separation form a irreversible tide into the future. Now you are few, soon you will be many. Now you are relatively weak, soon you will realize your full strength. And for once in human history, it will all be based on love, not anger, not fear, not war, not suffering. The bloodless revolution does that mean that this time of transition for the world will be painless and without blood? No. Your time of transition has not been painless and without blood. What it means is that that which is dawning will not be ruled by fear. It doesn't mean that every human being is going to see the light and start hugging each other instead of fighting each other. Someday when this promise is completely fulfilled, this is the beginning. This generation will see the turn of the tide. You won't live to see the fullness in this life. But you will live and are living to see a glorious beginning. And that which is going on in your life and that which is going on in humanity's life and in the life of the earth, your parent, is a glorious transformation. If you could see through the eyes of the Spirit what we see when we look at you, when we see a world not yet born but struggling to be born, when we see the effects of a new energy becoming your energy, it is inspiring. It is beautiful. It is transformation. The shadow is leaving. The darkness is ending. The light is coming on. The colors are blossoming. Your energies that have been muted and fogged, limited and blocked by fears are opening one by one by one by one into a bouquet of spirit. Well, you can see that vision. You can see the reality of that new birth. You are living that reality in your own lives. You are sharing that reality with each other. And it doesn't matter that the dying monster of the duality is thrashing its tail as it expires in its death throes, knocking over buildings and trees, causing destruction and chaos. It will not stop what is being born. It will not block the future, the new reality. Focus on what is being born. Be a part of that birth and let those who will die, die. They're not lost. No one is lost. Nothing is ever lost. Life is eternal. And you are on your way to discovering within yourself and living a life without limitation. Yes. Uh, question. How can a person overcome a physical handicap? Physical uh, handicaps uh, uh, are, of course, uh, based upon spiritual imbalance, upon karmic matters, upon... Uh, uh, issues that have their birth in the in the spirit and their effect uh, in the flesh. Now, there are various reasons that you uh, create physical impairments uh, in order, always in order, to point up an issue uh, 
in order to put you in a path in which a particular lesson needs to be learned relating to that uh, invited limitation, when you go through this process of change leading to wholeness, most, not all, in this stage of human development, but many of these physical limitations can be healed. They can be healed by yourself and by the intuition of the self opening to the right other energies coming into your life. Now, obviously, at this point of, uh, of uh, human life, if, uh, if you've lost a leg, you're not going to get the leg back. If the spine has been crushed, you don't have yet the capability of healing that crushed spine. But what we want to say in regard to living without limitation, all right, now here is a limitation that becomes, because of its nature, a permanent part for the lifetime, a permanent element of the life. Well, there are also uh, rules regarding the entire universe and all of human life. The uh, physical nature of the universe uh, bears with it uh, certain limitations, certain uh, uh, barriers, uh, things that can be done, things that cannot be done. You haven't touched yet uh, in uh, any depth on what you can do within the rules, but there are rules. It is the rules of the game, this particular game. Then that physical limitation becomes a part of the rules of your particular game. Limitation, a life without limitation, does not necessarily mean a life in which you can walk. Now, you think, well, that's a limitation. Yes, but it is a limitation that is designed into the fabric of the life, designed to release you in another way in which there will be greater expansion, compensatory, if you will, expansion, because of the nature of that limitation. Now, the kind of limitations we were primarily talking about are self-imposed uh, limitations, are spiritual, are emotional, and are often uh, physical. And you are designed as human beings ultimately to be self-maintaining. You have the ability to heal, to bring healing on, on a physical level as well as spiritual, emotional, and mental healing. You have the ability to bring healing to yourself. You have the ability to pass that healing on to others. And the healing is all-encompassing. But as yet, you are, as we have said, the pioneers. You are beginning to realize your wholeness. That process of realization goes on into this era that is beginning. It reaches its uh, fruition, its completion, probably hundreds of years uh, on into the future. But the limitation that we are trying to deal with here tonight has to do with a belief system that has been inculcated regarding what you can do and what you can't do. Obviously, you are not designed with wings, and a life without limitation does not mean that you will be able to fly unaided. So there are uh, elements like that that become permanent parts of the life. But we, uh, we take for an obvious example uh, Helen Keller. Now, here is a spirit totally, uh, for all intents and purposes, locked away within herself, uh, unable to see, to speak, to hear, unable to communicate in any understandable uh, way and un unable to receive communication, isolated, lost, uh, uh, you know, uh, an exaggeration of the kind of alienation that is a part of every human life. And yet, those apparent terrible limitations provided a focus of energy in which she transcended physical limitations that most people couldn't even imagine transcending. Well, you are all in the process of learning to transcend limitations, to stretch limits, to discover how much you can do as who you are. You know, as we said, your idea of perfection isn't really what's uh, at stake here. Your perfection is going to become, is going to be realized by becoming truly yourself, true to your nature in this incarnation, true to your oneness with God, but not out of this world and not no longer you, but a you that is balanced, 
but still personal, still uh, still a, uh, a specific character. And uh, so there are many rules associated with that, and uh, and uh, that may be regarded as limitations. But your personal limitations are transcended by your transformation. What is left is the structure of your life designed to focus you in particular ways. Yes. Well, yes. Well, so often when you share a vision or an idea with another. Limits are placed upon the idea in terms of negativity, ideas of scarcity that you can't have at all. How might one deal with that to help foster and create the birth of an idea or a vision? Yes. Uh, you may regard that as a challenge to you in your uh, understanding and allegiance to this uh, aborning idea, recognizing uh, that much of the uh, soil in which you uh, seek to plant seeds is infertile and uh, recognizing that your own belief is being challenged by this and that you look at that situation as a challenge to yourself to your integrity to the uh, to the shining quality of that belief there isn't any way for you to convince one who will not be convinced all you can do is to offer your wares your idea and uh, and uh, your inspiration and your vision and say uh, this is uh, what I feel this has uh, been my uh, experience and my reality and I open to share it with you now also where there is an idea that uh, that is uh, being uh, born within you and you wish to share it you are also relying upon your own intuition to draw you together with those who will ignite as a result of that idea where the f soil will be fertile so it's also a process of faith. There isn't really a formula to conquer negativity because everyone more or less is married to negativity and some are so married to it that they will not change. They don't have to. You know, they've got free will and they're not interested in changing. It's too threatening to go through the mammoth readjustment of ideas and attitudes necessary to open oneself to let go of of negativity and uh, for them you offer your wares and uh, if your wares are not taken you tip your hat and uh, and you go on and uh, until the wares are accepted yes Buzz, um, I've heard a lot of people uh, expressing that the energies in the last week or so have been really bizarre Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what's going on? Yes. And what can we do to ground ourselves? Because the, the traditional remedies aren't working very well. No, it is. Uh, it is a difficult and tumultuous time. We sp uh, we've spoken uh, earlier about this, but also about the fact that. Uh, that you are dealing with a wave of Christ energy now that was triggered by a, uh, a solar eclipse in, in the sign of Aries and bears the Aries characteristics. And uh, it is a time of rapid action. It is also a time in which you are, uh, we've said before, putting your money where your mouth is, taking action based on your belief, uh, turning theory into reality. It is, uh, uh, therefore, a very threatening time. It is threatening, however, not on a surface level, but on a deep level. It is, again, as we've spoken before, now you're dealing with the roots of issues within you. Those matters are being triggered that have been hidden from your own notice, from your own regard and your own understanding. They are being activated by this transformative energy. You are, as we spoke earlier this evening, you are it, uh, at a point of betwixt and between, ending being one thing and beginning being another thing. And, uh, and uh, as such, the ground too uh, shakes beneath you. Furthermore, this whole energy change situation has far-reaching implications. In its impact, in this Christ energy impact upon the world, a world dying of fear, the effect is an exacerbation of that fear, the power of the light, the power of love, rears back the power of fear the power that has been commanding 
human allegiance. The pot is being mixed. Two energies are contending. You have, as a race and as individuals, for the purpose of enlightenment, left the light, been exploring the dark. Earth has, in effect, been ruled by fear throughout human history. That is what has been in charge. Here is a challenge to the throne. Here is an energy that cannot be denied because it is the energy of reality. And when you wake up to this energy, there's no going back to sleep again. Once you begin to see through the nature of fear, you're never going to believe in it again. We've sp uh, spoken to you about your own inner dying and being reborn. Well, that's happening in you, that's happening on earth, that's happening in all of humanity. And you are engaged in a time and a process that is revolutionary in its impact. You are feeling in your lives these transformative energies. Well, you're going along with them. You've, encour you've encouraged them. You want them. You want to be transformed. You're committed to it. You believe in it. Well, there are so many who uh, don't believe in it, don't want it, are frightened to death of the very notion of taking full responsibility for their lives, of accepting freedom, of living in love. And so the energy that encourages all of that creates massive fear response elsewhere. So now we're talking about the world, we're talking about humanity in general, but that's also going on in you, a little world, a little humanity in one body. And so there is so much reprogramming, so much deprogramming, uh, so much uh, change of input that is going on, and so much challenge, much of which at this relatively early stage in this uh, flow of energy, you are not yet recognizing, you're only feeling the energy, not identifying it, not acting on it. You are receiving the stimulus to which you will later respond. And so, uh, yes, and there are astrological reasons too, but they are incorporated into the human plan. So we don't have to look at them as though that was a, a separate uh, matter. So astrological uh, uh, triggers accompany the process and do uh, cause uh, varying uh, changes in the energy flow within the context of this wave of Christ energy. It's not going to be uh, this bad, folks. Uh, it, uh, it's not going to be as tough as it is uh, right now. As we say, there's so much going on that you don't understand that it makes it more confusing and harder to deal with. And you go back to old tried and true uh, methods of pulling yourself out, and they're not working because you're at a different stage in your own uh, development and because they're really not supposed to work because you've got to feel this stress. It is a part of the journey. It's not uh, something that you say, oh, well, I can do the journey without feeling the stress. The stress is a part of it. It's part of the recipe. Uh, it forces you, quote, unquote, you're forcing yourself by, uh, by allowing yourself, but it puts you into a position where you are going to respond to challenges in a particular way. And, uh, and it's necessary. Um, alleviation we would say should uh, already uh, be beginning or will be, uh, it has begun, but should be uh, felt in a more conscious way over the next couple of weeks. Um, you're not going to be in the same kind of confusing every which way kind of stress. Now, we heard somebody mention uh, dreams. And uh, that, of course, is a great part of it. You know, you can uh, wake up in the morning just uh, not only exhausted, but full of confusing images and, and feeling a half memory of raging emotions and actions and, and all sorts of images and symbols and so forth. You are under uh, a tremendous onslaught, not more than you can handle, but more than you think you can handle, a tremendous onslaught of input on all levels. And this presentation and resolution of issues on the dream level is dealing with those matters that you are not consciously either aware of or in charge of. So you are dealing at the unconscious, subconscious, but higher conscious level in the dream state, 
with the fear issues that you're dealing with at another level in your waking state. But it means that you're putting in a 24-hour day. And uh, and it is uh, it is exhausting, but as we pointed out recently, and want to ma- uh, are glad of the opportunity of making this point again, you are not victims of this process. A, you are cooperating in the process, and B, you are in charge. The whole purpose of the lessons, all of the lessons in this change, are to prove to you and for you to prove to yourself that you are in charge. And in this uh, spiritual process, you need to exercise that too. And when you get to a point and you say, with all the best will in the world, I can't take another step. I need a break. I need an emotional break. I need a physical break. I need a spiritual break. Ask and it shall be given. You are in charge. Now, you're not going to take a year off, but a good weekend wouldn't hurt. (laughs) So, uh, but, uh, but remember that, you know, you are coming into closer and closer communication with your own higher self, the higher self that you have been allowing to guide this process because it's, it's in charge. It knows more about it than the ego self does that you're used to working with. But the higher self is also you. The higher self is not interested in killing you. It is interested in proving to you that you are stronger than you think you are and that you need to stretch your limits in order to realize that strength. So don't think that you can just uh, end the exhausting process because that is a part of the process. But when you say in your heart and in honesty and in love for yourself, I need a break, you'll get a break. Sometimes, um, like... Before a change comes, even if it's a few, like a few months or however long it has, sometimes I feel like I get like tugs of feelings, like these overwhelming feelings to like quit my job, pack my car, and but like there's new horizons and I'm feeling like I'm getting ready. It's a it's hard to explain, and I think I'd probably be packing if it was time. Yes. Well, remember this: that as a result of this process, your percep- perceptions are changing. Deepening, you're activating your psychic spiritual talents. You're becoming more aware on all levels. Uh, it's a, a gradual period of becoming uh, used to and recognizing how you're expanding psychically because you're not used to it. But you are uh, not only more sensitive to what is unspoken among you, more sensitive to emotions, uh, but you are also able to transcend to a degree time. That is to say, and it's been said before, that uh, coming events cast their shadow before them, and you are more receptive to that shadow, responding still at a pretty subconscious level, but groping toward more awareness of what is coming next. And so what is coming next, the the, uh, the uh, ongoing goal of your ongoing growth, does begin to communicate itself uh, to you. And you are, of course, preparing yourself for your uh, for the full manifestation of your purpose in terms of your life's work, not necessarily your vocation or how you earn your living, but what you do and what is vital to you. And uh, this process of preparation is bringing you closer and closer. You're becoming more and more aware. You're gradually becoming more and more one with yourself, which means one with your purpose. And so it's simply the symptoms of becoming whole. Yes. Claudus, you've talked about uh, the concept of balance, and I'm having some difficulty with that. Could you speak to that idea, please? Yes. In the human realm, of course, God is balanced. There's no issue of, of, of balance with God. But here you are enrolled in a mystery school called the Earth Reality, Earth High. <laughs> and uh, And you're going to Earth High to learn specific things. Remember, you are, you are dealing with eternity and a, an eternity that is devoted to growth. Uh, so uh, these few millennia that you uh, spend at Earth High are about equivalent to the four years that you spend at high school. And, uh, and uh, you have certain things to learn and a certain goal to reach under the rules of this school, under the, uh, according to the curriculum of this school. And so what the curriculum of this school has had to do with was imbalance, division, duality, separation. 
where you have entered into a world breaking yourself in half, into the ego half that has been in charge and the spirit half that you no longer are capable of connecting with except at rare intervals, just enough to keep you aware that there is such an animal. And uh, now you're in a point where, uh, where that you've been searching for all of these years of bringing th both aspects into balance, letting go of the fear, letting go of the darkness aspect, but the human that has been the ego self, the representation, the human, uh, with the divine, the higher self, that which, uh, which is uh, spirit. Uh, bringing those together in balance. And so all of the work that you do in your life, in relationships, deals with inequ inequity, inequality, imbalance, unfairness, uh, with, uh, with uh, cheating and with lying and with stealing and with not being true to yourself and with betraying people and being betrayed, having to do with imbalance in all kinds of ways and having to do with healing of imbalance. So you are born into the darkness. The healing, uh, going into the light, is the healing. That brings the balance. Balance, healing, light, love, all one. And uh, so the goal is to become the balanced human being, balanced between spirit and flesh. You see. So... You say that we are all to be like God. Um, as I look about this world that's supposedly governed by this God, I see a lot of pain. You know, we're designed so that we experience pain. Yes, this physical God, pain, emotional pain, mental pain, spiritual pain, all kinds of pain. This God inflicts this pain. Nah, no, God does not... In like yes, God. yes. Does that mean that we are to inflict pain also? No. God does not inflict the pain. You are a part... Don't look at God as, as an old man sitting on a hill throwing uh, thunderbolts. God is you. God is you writ large. God is you whole. God is not separable from you, nor are you separable from God. Together, let us say, you and God devised a game and a school, a plan that will lead to the enrichment of understanding that is a part of being God, that leads, even God must improve, must grow, even that which is perfect must become more perfect, however unlikely that may seem to the human ear. You are in a process in human life of realizing your God nature. To realize your God nature, you go through the opposite, the polarity, because you're in a world of duality, of polarity. And so you explore what is the opposite of God's nature. The nature of God, the nature of reality is love. You and God together have created this thing called fear, you have created all of the subcategories of fear, which include pain of varying kinds. You explore that experience, those experiences of pain as a human being on your way to working through that thicket of pain that you have designed to be solved as a game is designed to be won, as a school is designed to be graduated from. You have created what you experience and what you experience allows you to recreate yourself with greater understanding, with greater depth, with greater knowledge, with greater strength. God does not cause evil because God is evil. Evil is falsehood. It is created as a game for spirits to play. You know, when you're lost in fear and experiencing pain, which has been all of your history as human beings up to now, you are distracted by it and you think, this is awful, because you are so deeply aware, subliminally, of who you really are and what reality is really like, and you think, I'm stuck in this, and a year seems like a long time, and 70 years seems like a vastly long time, and pain seems real. 
But when you find that it's not real, and when you return to the wider reality and to your whole self and to your oneness with God, you are taken away from that limited vision of the human being lost in pain and fear, and it simply becomes one of the rules of the game, one of the experiences that has led you onward. Don't judge what hurts and what feels good by your human response. Your godly response sees these experiences as adventures, playing a game of hide-and-go-seek, playing an amnesiac game in which you th pretend that you've forgotten that you are God. Well, that's a lot of fun for God, pretending he's not God. It just doesn't seem like fun while you're playing the game. Well, <laughs> if you've, uh, you know, if you, if you like games, if you like to play games, board games or card games, you have uh, variously experienced uh, victory and defeat and, uh, and uh, you uh, could uh, play a, a game of, uh, of Monopoly and have it go, uh, go on for hours and, uh, and lose everything and, and feel competitive and feel frustrated and, and, uh, and feel put down because you're losing and this game is no fun anyway, and I don't know why I suggested uh, playing it, and I'm certainly never going to play it again. And then a little while goes by, and you think, wouldn't it be fun to play a game of Monopoly again? <laughs> well, think of this as playing a game of Celestial Monopoly, and, uh, and, uh, and enjoy it. Yes? I've been wondering, is there such thing as accidental death, and if not, how is it that seatbelts off the road saves lives? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. Uh, no, uh, there is no such thing as accidental death. Death always occurs with the agreement of the death E. If you are going to leave this incarnation, it means that you are finished with what you are here to do. It doesn't necessarily mean you've done it. But in many cases, you've put yourself in a situation because you need to experience the depth of despair. You need to experience what happens to you on the road to failure. And so then you pull the plug on yourself and you think, uh, well, uh, the person thinks I'm killing myself because I just can't stand living anymore. But the fact is, you're pulling the plug because you're done. You've experienced what you needed to experience, despair, loss, anguish. And the other lives that you are living will live uh, are going to be picking up the thread where you left off there, building on that experience, coming closer to releasing the causes of that despair, and so on and so forth. And uh, sometimes you are living a life in which the primary goal of that life is the loving lesson that you have to offer to someone else that they need to have. And so you may enter life as a, as a baby, a newborn baby, and you may live only hours and have accomplished what you came to accomplish. And yet you may live 98 years. And when you die, then you've accomplished what you came here to accomplish. So there are no accidental deaths. Now, the matter of uh, of seatbelts and... and uh, and other means of, uh, of uh, safety are also a part of your growing wisdom, empathy, understanding, caring for each other. Colored by fear, yes. Even poisoned to an extent by fear, where there's a paranoia about death. Because to, still, to so many, death is the end, you see, and you want to avoid the end, and you're afraid of death because it's the unknown. As we said earlier, the ego won't have any truck with the unknown. So it is going to cooperate with you in your fear of death, a death that doesn't in fact exist, a consciousness that is never ended even for a moment. So, uh, so you create, and, and you look at recent human history, and uh, in many areas, and, and you think, well, A, here's a polarity again. Here are people uh, who are limiting their fun in the interests of safety. Well, that has a polarity to it. It has an increasing wisdom, an increasing caring for the lives and the well-being of others, but also an increasing fear of death, because this is a time of death and rebirth. 
and both the love is growing and the fear is growing in general. And so you've got uh, uh, people who say, well, uh, children uh, shouldn't uh, uh, have any more firecrackers and uh, fireworks and so forth on the 4th of July because it's too dangerous and they, you know, they might light one, blow off a, f a finger and, uh, and uh, no, you can't have that BB gun because you'll put your eye out and, uh, and all of the fears that weren't there in the in human past, even in the recent past, in which it was simply expected that life is full of uh, of dangers and some of them are fun. So uh, you see, it is a polarity and it is a sign of growth and it's a sign of of the death of fear. Yes. Tell us what then following up on that for uh, intentional death, suicide. Well, yes, we mentioned that uh, suicide that uh, uh, that you may think you are killing yourself because you have lost your love or because you have drunk yourself into sensibility and have lost your hope or for any uh, number of uh, immediate reasons. In fact, the higher self is aware this work, this life, this experiment, this uh, involvement has gone as far as it needs to go to learn the lesson that needed to be learned. Not all lives, very few lives, are there to be solved in the course of a lifetime. The life is solved in the course of many lifetimes. It's really, in a sense, one life you're leading but you're living here, and you're living there, and you're man, and you're woman, and uh, you're rich, and you're poor, and you're black, and you're white, but it's one life. You see. What, is, what about the effect that has on the people that you have a relationship with when you when you die? Is that the other side of the coin? The There's always <clears throat> nothing is ever done in a vacuum. You are not an island, and everything that takes place in your life has an effect on the lives that are close to you. The timing of a death is taken into consideration. You must understand here that uh, that your present state of human understanding and ability to visualize has been limited as all other uh, of your uh, traits and characteristics and abilities have been limited. But we want to say that there is an in what would look to you like an incredibly complex and intricate arrangement of cause, effect, and timing relating to all of humanity and how you interact with each other. And so... A, uh, person A is finished with his incarnation and is time to quote unquote die and move on. The timing of that event will be put in motion by the needs of the people to be affected by the event and, uh, and so on and so forth. And all major events are so timed. Nothing occurs without an echo. The tree falling in the forest without anyone around does make a noise. Now we're going to call this uh, reading uh, to a close, and we thank you all for your attention, and we bid you Godspeed as your journeys continue to open to you. Thank you. Thank you.